Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats so we can start the plenary number two concerning the research infrastructures addressing grand societal challenges. We'll be talking about two main challenges in the next part of uh, this conference, so please take your seat. Uh, there will be plenty of time. I do promise to talk to your colleagues afterwards so we can keep the schedule that is prepared for today's conference. So please take your seat. We'll be starting in a moment's time. Thank you very much. We have just one planet to work with. We have just one planet to live on. We have just one planet we can use to the greatest benefit of not only humankind. And naturally, there is a lot of work to do. There are a lot of work we need to do together to make sure that we can make it sustainable in the greatest possible way. And concerning this conference, we, may, we need to make it sustainable as well to keep the schedule. So please make sure that you are seated in no time so we can keep the schedule that is tight and prepared for distinguished guests, speakers with uh, great experience to share concerning in the next part, in the plenary number two, two, to two main topics that we will discuss. First of all, we will talk about COVID-19 and the pandemics of infectious diseases. And secondly, we will concentrate on environment, climate change and mitigation. As I have mentioned, it will be the plenary number two. In today's program, we have enjoyed the plenary number one. And we can make a short recap for you who are here in Brno, as well as for those who are joining us online. We have over 400 delegates that are seating immediately, please, on the seats here in Brno, and getting ready for also those who are joining us online, over 600 of them, to check out what was happening here in Brno. Let's have a look on what happened in today's program. You can see the sketch noting that was prepared by Bea, Bea Broskova, who is keeping an eye on everything. Yes. <laughs> Honestly, remarkable job. Great job that she done describing what was happening in International Conference on Research Infrastructures. We talk about the imagination, about the importance of communication, impact of research infrastructures, as well as collaboration, sharing experience, the research goals that we can gain and that we can create, as well as about sharing and gaining the full potential. We talk about the perspectives of all the guests that were on stage, sharing their the experience and their perspectives during the debate. You can learn in detail what is needed to help the RIs during the energy crisis, using innovations to decrease energy consumption. We talk about the role of politicians, what the politicians are supposed to do to help the scientists to make sure that they can truly make things for a better life for everybody. We talk about the challenges, and you can learn what was said in today's program here in Brno. So you can remember everything in detail. But as I have mentioned, Bea was working on the first part, but that does not mean that she is done. Not at all. Let's make sure that we are ready for the second part of today's program. Be very careful. That's what I'm saying to myself, not to her, because she is very careful. Because this great picture will be available in digital form as well. But I will adjust it in a great detail for the, digital po for the digital world. So you will have a chance to download it. Naturally, a lot of you took pictures 
with it out of or of it. Nature, you are also welcome to do it after the planetary number two. Now we are starting with the planetary concerning COVID-19 pandemic. It was science, not politics, who offered solutions in the era of pandemic of COVID-19. We have been learning, we have been learning on an unprecedented speed. We have learned so much in a, such a short time. It was science who was offering what to do, what concrete steps the general public can do to tackle the pandemic and to help them live a safer life. We face common problems and we must collaborate on finding common solutions. How to do it? What are the lessons learned? We are starting with the perspective of Director General of European Molecular Biology Laboratory. We are starting with Edith Hart. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. It's, uh, it's a real honor to be here, and I'm so happy um, because I think uh, having this conference in, in this country is a fantastic uh, demonstration of what European infrastructures are about. And so it's my real pleasure to be speaking in this plenary session. And maybe I can just start by saying that I think this pandemic has really shown us that a global crisis can only be fought by global collaboration, by open science, and rapid sharing of data and knowledge. And I really think that we have learned some very important lessons. So I'm going to tell you what we learned at the European Molecular Biology Laboratory. Um, so we are Europe's only intergovernmental laboratory for life science research. We have to deliver on five missions. One is excellent research. One is access to infrastructures and delivery of scientific services. We work across six different uh, institutes, six different sites in five different countries, and we have to serve 27 member states and one associate member state, Australia. We provide advanced training, training from the youngest to the oldest and across the board, both internally trained people and externally facing training. So our courses and conferences are known throughout the world. We have to do innovation and translation. We develop some of the technologies that were used to fight this pandemic. Genomics, technologies, data resources, cryo-EM. These are amongst the inventions that came from the EMBL. And last but not least, we are here to integrate life sciences in Europe. And I think this is a, a wonderful opportunity to see how life sciences in Europe can be integrated. So just some facts and figures are shown here. I want to highlight, for example, that Every single day, we have 107 million web requests to our European Bioinformatics uh, in, uh, Institute data services. This is one of our six sites, the one in Hingston in the UK, and it is, I think, the world's biggest bioinformatics infrastructure. So, what was EMBL's impact during the pandemic? Well, basically, as any good infrastructure should, we were able to rapidly serve and rapidly evolve. It was absolutely key that we already had much of our teams, our people, um, and the equipment and uh, resources ready to go. And this, I think, uh, is one of the very important lessons that we learned, is that the sustainability of infrastructures is absolutely crucial. So we were able to deliver our scientific services, um, all of our services were open throughout the pandemic. We were able to actually do research. Um, many of our scientists were able to repurpose some of the things they were doing in order to be relevant. We continued our training. We did advanced training uh, both internally, but also with some of our conferences. We immediately started to organize SARS-CoV-2 meetings where we brought in stakeholders from both the scientific world, but also from the political world. We also delivered on the front of innovation and translation, and many of our scientists were able to partner up um, with industrial partners and develop new technologies that are, are, are now already being used um, in SARS-CoV-2 uh, research. And last but not least, we were able to really integrate uh, life sciences by bringing people together, collaborating, working with people, and sharing um, the, our science and our knowledge. So I just want to give you two examples of uh, EMBL infrastructure uh, response. Uh, one is the COVID-19 data platform um, that was set up by the European Commission. And this was actually based on our data portals, our COVID-19 data portals at EMBL EBI together with Elixir. And these were absolutely instrumental in allowing people to share data 
high quality data, open access across the globe. So um, this uh, platform was showcased, or the project was showcased uh, in the Paris Peace Forum in 2020. And it was very rapidly taken up and has actually shown us that this is a very important way of making sure that um, data and knowledge can be shared. The whole pipeline of not only generating the data, the viral data as it evolved, but also uh, human clinical data and trying to make sense of all of this in an open and sharing way was absolutely crucial. On the other side of the slide, you can see um, our Emble Hamburg infrastructure. We're located on the DAISY campus, and we actually run some of the beam lines that were used by BioNTech together with several institutes. So this is a very nice example of co collaboration between academic and industrial partners. And it was thanks to the ongoing collaborations there that we were able to help the production of better packaging for mRNA vaccines. Um, and so this, this uh, was to do with the lipid nanoparticles that are used in a peg-free delivery of these um, mRNA vaccines and were absolutely crucial for the rapid delivery of what we were then all being uh, able to, to be uh, vaccinated with. So I also just wanted to give you some snapshots of the research that happened at EMBL. We went from the genomic tracking of COVID-19 in England, and actually some of the modeling that was done in the UK was then used across Europe. Um, we also were able to look into how uh, drugs that were already available could be repurposed to manage uh, COVID-19 pro uh, progression. We were able to use advanced imaging approaches to look at how uh, SARS-CoV-2 can actually uh, not only infect our cells, but completely reshape their insides. And last but not least, we were able to also deliver new synthetic mini-antibodies that are, were being used to combat COVID-19. So these are just some of the examples, but to show you that indeed, um, Amble was able to rapidly rise up in these areas. So I just want to um, finish by saying a few words about the future. We've just started a new program at EMBL, a new five-year program, which we believe opens up a new area, er era of uh, molecular biology. And this is highly relevant to what happened during the pandemic. Life does not happen in isolation. It happens in an environment of communities, of populations. So when we were hit by the pathogen that we're currently living, we were already thinking about, well, how can we actually make sure that we can provide mechanistic understandings of what happens in real life in an environmental context? So our new program is available online for those who are interested. And within that program, one of the big topics was actually um, infection. I do want to just say that um, in the context of uh, infection biology, we have many, many different projects that are ongoing. Um, our aims are to try and elucidate molecular mechanisms of pathogens as they infect, look at host pathogen interfaces, and at our Barcelona site, for example, we're building up tissue models, vascularized models, to really try and look at how uh, viruses and parasites and microbes can actually contribute to disease. And of course, we're developing anti-infectious uh, strategies. And so, um, again, please do learn more um, online. And I just want to end by saying that we have um, many new services that we are now providing thanks to the new program. One of our big hits last year was AlphaFold. This was a collaboration with DeepMind, Google DeepMind. We were able to make available to the world the 3D protein structures of almost every protein in humans and across, um, across the known organisms. So this has been a huge success with um, AlphaFold being cited by more than 1,300 papers. It makes structural biology much easier and it really does uh, represent a revolution, I think, in the life sciences. We have a brand new imaging center which is open to all and which is already functioning um, having been built during the pandemic. And last but not least, we want to bring EMBL to our member states. So we have now created mobile labs, or we're creating them right now, in order to be able to bring our experts, our equipment, and to do public outreach and science education across Europe, um, and to really try and make sure that we can build bridges with different um, disciplines and scientists in different member states, including, of course, the Czech Republic. And so with that, um, I will end. I'm going in the wrong direction. Apologies. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Hart. I will have a lot of follow-up questions. 
Uh, I will save that for the debate, especially concerning uh, the consequences for the general public. Because concerning, for example, what you have mentioned, the structure biology, there are huge consequences for the general public that needs to be learned by the general public. Let's talk about the preparation that, wa that was mentioned by uh, Dr. Hart. European Union wants to be more prepared for emergencies like the COVID-19 pandemic. That's why HERA was created. HERA, an organization that should help us to learn from what was happening and is happening during the COVID-19 pandemics to be, have a greater and a better response in the future. We need to use and be prepared for the potential to make sure that we can react in a better way. Director General of European Health Emergency Preparedness and Response Authority, known as HERA, Pierre Deslaw, is the next to go on the stage. Please. Director General. Thank you very much and good afternoon to everybody. I feel a little bit like an al alien, you know, because, you know, I'm just in the middle, in the midst of researchers, and I'm talking about authorities that nobody knows, HERA. You know, I can make a, a survey to know exactly who knows about HERA. So maybe let me try to explain why am I here and what we want to achieve. And for that, we need first to understand lessons from the COVID crisis. And you already said it, Dan. You know, when the COVID crisis started, we were not ready. And actually, nobody was ready in the world. Simply, there was not the measures which were needed to, to fight the COVID crisis, you know. Do I need to remind you about the mask, about, you know, the difficulties to find vaccines, therapeutics, even al alcohol, gel, and these kind of things were not available. So we were not ready. The second message from the COVID crisis was the fact that simply we found, we found solutions by working together, by being united in Europe, but also globally. And that was extremely important, and by building a partnership between scientists, industry, and public authority. And the third element, maybe the third major aspect of the COVID crisis, is the fact that health issues are global. We no longer live in a world where we are isolated. You know, I still remember when the first cases of Omicron started, Omicron variant started in South Africa, we reacted in Europe, we blocked the borders, we stopped, you know, all the flights coming from Europe, from Africa, sorry. Two weeks later, we had the first cases in uh, Europe, and three more weeks later, everybody was infected with the Omicron uh, variant. So we live in a global world, and we cannot stop that. So that's why ERA has been created. Actually, we are still the new kid in town, you know, we are only, we have been created a year ago, so we are still very new. We are growing, but still small, but growing. And of course, which is important for you, we have a budget, and I will come back to that, because when we talk about research, budget is a key word. So, uh, ERA. Let's forget, let's keep the acronym, because the word itself is too long. What do we want to do? Why are we there? ERA has been, has been created within the European Commission as a new authority, working with the member states, working with industry, and we have two functions, actually. One of them, which is to prepare for the future, for the next health crisis, and the second one is to be in charge of health crisis when there is one. Actually, we are still in the COVID crisis. You know, the number of cases is growing. So, for instance, as ERA, we are managing the vaccines contract. We are in charge of discussing with the companies to make sure that for those who want to get a booster, and I st strongly recommend you to have a booster, you will get it uh, it's thanks to ERA. You might have seen that we have had the monkeypox crisis also with a certain number of people who have been affected. As ERA, we have negotiated the purchase of vaccines and donated them to the member states. So that's our role in terms of crisis. We are there to react collectively on behalf of all the member states, and we are there to try to make sure that all the technologies, vaccines, uh, therapeutics, uh, tools which are available will be, uh, will be at the disposal of the member state at the end of the day of the citizen. But the more fundamental role also, which is the role of ERA, is the role of preparedness, to be ready for the next health crisis. Because I can tell you one thing, there will be a new health crisis. I don't know when, I don't know which form it will take, but I can guarantee you, you will be facing new health crisis in the future. At the point, we don't know which one. We don't know what will be the size, we don't know what will be the consequences of such health crisis. But we have learned with the COVID crisis that when you have a real health crisis, you know, the whole world is being affected. 
So we need to be prepared for the next health crisis. What does it mean? What do we do as ERA? First element, we are building mechanisms, tools, and probably electronic platform to try to detect as early as possible a new health threat happening somewhere in the world. You know, something which might happen in the middle of South America could be in Europe and could affect you very quickly. So we, as I say, we live in a global world. So we are building an electronic platform which will be connecting all platforms which exist and also adding new elements to make sure that we try to improve the uh, det early detection of future health threat using also artificial intelligence because we believe this is extremely important. Second element, and that's more of concern for you, and I told you we have a budget. Actually, we have a budget of one billion to spend every year. What is the second element? You know, people, I keep going somewhere in many places and where people are saying the COVID vaccines were available very quickly to success. Yes, they were available very quickly. But why were they available very quickly? Because they were preceded by long-term investment in research on the mRNA platform. You know, mRNA platform has been actually there for quite a long time and a lot of investment have taken place in research and development before the COVID vaccines were available and were at the disposal of everybody. So what we want to do as ERA, we want to use part of our budget to invest in new research, in new innovation, and that could be of concern for you. We are looking for new investment in research to simply to prepare us for new health crisis. Just to give you a very concrete example, and that's short term, of course, we have more longer term investment, but very short term, we are now looking on a new types of COVID vaccines. What do I mean by this? You know, you have a new variant, now you adapt the existing mRNA technology, and then you get a new vaccine. But by the time the new variant is there, by the time you have the new vaccine, several months have elapsed, and that could be too long. What do we want to do? We want to finance and to try to create a new COVID vaccine, which would try to cover all kinds of possible variants. So no, not running behind the variants, but trying to cover all kinds of possible variants for the future. So this is a concrete example, but that's linked to the COVID vaccines. But we have many other examples of many long-term investments that we want to do. And finally, as ERA, we have a role also of uh, building what we call medical countermeasures. What does it mean? It means stockpiling, you know, purchasing vaccines, purchasing therapeutics, purchasing equipment. We need to do it if we want to be ready for the next crisis. You know, that's very concrete examples. You know, we have purchased, as I told you, the monkeypox vaccines, probably too many vaccines for, uh, for the current situation, because things are improving a bit with respect to monkeypox. But those vaccines are also useful for smallpox. I know smallpox has disappeared, but who knows? Who knows? You know, we, we live in a world where you might have threats which are coming necessary, not necessarily from nature, but also from human beings. So we want, we want to be ready, and that's part of our role of ERA. Now, you know, I told you I'm an alien, you know, within you in, in, this, uh, in this meeting. I'm an alien, but not completely. Because as I told you, we want to invest in research. We want to make sure that you help us to develop the tools of the future to try to prevent future health crisis. So we need to have this, that's why I wanted to come here, because I need to have this contact with you, with this community, to make sure actually that we work together to develop those tools. And I told you, we have a budget. And also, more concretely, we want also to create, and I've been very impressed by what I've seen just before, but we want to create also a network of laboratories in Europe. Because we believe it's important also that when we are faced with new health threats, we have a network of laboratories working together. So we're in the process of establishing it. Because that's extremely important. You know, just again to give you a very concrete example, when the first Omicron case started in, uh, in Europe, only one country, one laboratory had the strain, you know, as an example of, uh, of the variant. And we have, what have we done? We have organized sharing of this with different laboratories so they could work together and could develop something. So we believe this is important cooperation, cooperation between laboratories, cooperation between scientists is fundamental if you want to develop. So ERA is very new, but we are there to last. You know, we will be there for the many years. I got a question before from the press saying, are you going to survive? You never know, of course, for sure. 
Personally, no, I know that I will die one day, that's for sure, but ERA will continue to, to survive because that's a very important element and that's something which is there, as I say, to prepare for future health crisis. And I don't want to frighten you, but as a conclusion, be ready for the next one. Thank you very much. Such a positive ending. <laughs> After you were lured in by the one billion euros, you were told what's going to happen. But you're right. There is no question there. The, prob the probability is on your side. Unfortunately so. Let's give a different perspective. Let's add a perspective of a private company that is working to create new pharmaceuticals, that is working on research as well as on final products. Our next speaker is Vice President, Head of Disease Management Programs of Janssen Pharmaceutica, Teresa Pateri. Good afternoon. I'm so delighted and honored to be here to talk about what we in Global Public Health R&D is doing, public health settings and resource limited settings. And we are uniquely, uniquely, uniquely positioned to actually address unmet needs in infectious diseases, in emerging epidemic and pandemic threats, and also for neglected tropical diseases. And I was under the impression when I joined Global Public Health in J&J, in, &J, in Johnson & Johnson, that public health was underfunded, understaffed, and undersupported in resource-limited settings, low-middle-income countries. And to my gross surprise, I realized living in Belgium, staying in Belgium with the European Union, Belgium is also underfunded for public health settings because the Belgian government reached out to Johnson & Johnson, to GSK, Glaxo, as well as UCB, to try and increase the COVID-19 screening capacity during the COVID-19 breakdown, the lockdown, because there was only 5,000 tests per day. So we, as pharmaceutical companies, public-private partnership, actually increase the testing capacity from 5,000 to 50,000 per day, using our discovery labs as high throughput sites to actually do the screening tests. And we had 80 volunteers who worked from six in the morning, six o'clock in the morning to 10 in the night to make sure that those results were actually sent out on time. We had 24 hours to process those samples and send it out. And Catholic University of Leuven was sending us quality control samples and we had 100% proficiency testing pass every day. So I'm really proud of the team that worked on it. So we did a double job and we helped the government. So I'm going to start my talk with how we in global public health are actually advancing our clinical, our critical programs. So we leverage several building blocks and we try to combine them to make a difference in resource limited settings. So where do we start? We go all the way from a laboratory to last mile, which means we literally want to reach every patient everywhere in, on the globe. We want to make sure that the products that we produce are actually approved by the regulatory bodies everywhere at the same time. That's our aspiration and bold inspiration to actually work in public health settings and also to make sure that we are making a meaningful difference to the communities that we are living in and that we serve as well. So our R&D starts with looking at what are the infectious disease space, what are the emerging threats, how do we actually discover compounds, vaccines, antivirals, antibacterials, or any other small molecules or large molecules that can actually make a difference. We develop them, we conduct clinical trials. We also make sure that we are actually conducting some of those trials in the African and the Asian continent because we strongly believe in diversity, equity, and inclusion and it's part of our race to health equity. We also, my team is actually digital health and data sciences. So we're looking at open source digital tools which can empower patients and clinics to go from paper-based processes to paperless processes so it becomes digital. And I have an excellent, um, you know, an excellent tool called Vaccinate which has been used in Rwanda and it's being used by the World Health Organization for their COVID-19 solidarity trials which actually uses iris technology, iris scanning to identify people in resource limited settings because you do not have to touch the patient. Infectious diseases being infectious and contagious and you can actually, they don't have identity cards like us in the European Union. They can actually use the iris scanning as a technology to identify patients when they come back for their booster vaccinations as well. So vaccinate is an open source. It's, it's been applied as a global good as well. 
with Digital Square and WHO, and that is something that we are hopefully waiting for to have some good, you know, good, uh, good information from the WHO that has been accepted as well. So apart from that, we also do data sciences. We are looking at data analytics, outbreak prediction models, and we have actually published on COVID-19 with an outbreak prediction modeling. We're currently working on dengue, which is going to be the next uh, epidemic threat, pandemic threat as well, as Pia mentioned. So how can we prepare ourselves? So how can we prepare during peace times for war times, especially when it comes to microbes? So that's where we are trying to actually use artificial intelligence, machine learning. We're not working on our own. We're working with partner countries, partner institutions, public-private partnerships to make a difference there. And of course, supply chain is extremely critical because if we want to meet the last mile approach, we want to make sure that every patient everywhere is having access to good health infrastructure. And there we use different types of technologies as well. So for in the supply chain, we are actually you know, uh, flying medical drones in Uganda to the Kalangala Islands with HIV medications coming from PEPFAR and Global Drug Funds. So it's not even our medications. We just want to make sure that the island fisher folk are actually benefiting from the HIV medications. And that has finished phase two, and we're actually showing cost effectiveness using medical drones in such settings so that no patient is left behind. Then of course, we have supporting equitable access. We wanna make sure that our access team is able to get the regulatory approvals in the different countries, and we can make a difference for the infectious diseases like TB, dengue, leprosy, and several other, uh, several other diseases, including antimicrobial resistance towards it. Consumer insights is extremely important for us because if we understand the patient journey, we can make a bigger difference for the gaps in the different uh, healthcare systems, and we can actually learn from it to uh, improve the way we provide access to healthcare as well. And uh, if I divide, how are, we, how are we doing this in global public health R&D? So we have three ways of looking at it, translating the best science, and that is actually discovering compounds for neglected tropical diseases and infectious diseases, and making sure that they are developed and approved by the regulatory, regulatory bodies in the different parts of the world. Apart from that, we also want to make sure that public-private partnerships can actually make a difference. So how do we make sure that local talent is being developed? So we have a fellowship program with the Tropical Institute in Antwerp and us, where fellows come from the different African countries to us for two years. They learn the, the, the whole process from discovery to approvals. They go back to their countries and they are able to use the knowledge and the expertise to build their local leadership and also build the strength and strengthen their institutions as well. So it's not about data coming into j, &J for us to look into it or our data scientists. It's all about how can we leave the data where it is and get talent to look into it and actually develop their own solutions because that's where we need to go for in the future. We also are looking at the African continent with regards to how clinical trials are being conducted. Today, 26% of the disease burden is in the African continent, but only 1% of uh, clinical trials are, are being conducted in Africa. So we want to make a difference there and make sure that most of our almost all our clinical trials will make sure that we have patients in the African continent and in the Asian continent. And that's a promise that we have actually pledged internally as well. So I'm coming from the pink ball out there, designing innovation to enable greater impact. It's all about digital innovation and data sciences. And there we're trying to use low technologies like feature phone, mobile messaging, to actually help with adherence, making sure that patients come back to the clinics on time, they can complete their treatment, we don't lose them, and then thereby they can at least keep their disease under control or get a cure. But apart from that, we are also trying to look at data science analytics to make sure that we can we can actually predict the next, you know, predict the next epidemic or pandemic, which Pierre was talking about. So how do we do that? For within digital health and data sciences, it's really important to understand the step of the patient journey. And every patient journey, although it starts with case finding and ends with cure or relapse-free survival, the gaps are very different. Even in one continent, if you take South Africa, for instance, where Imran Patel was talking about, the gaps are very different from when you go to Ghana or Uganda. So you have, we have to address the gaps in the patient care pathway and try to come up with solutions which can be sustainable, locally adoptable, and also where the ministries of health in these countries see the value of it. So we have several platforms which are open source. 
They're disease agnostic, they're interoperable, they can actually uh, push data into the disease, uh, into the DHIS2 system, which is being used in many of these countries. And they can also be used for the purposes which is needed with regards to the gaps. So Connect for Life actually empowers patients to make sure that they have in, in, enough information on the diseases that they have, so there's health information being shared. They can act, actually connect back to the clinic, to the treatment coordinators, to try and speak about their side effects. It also helps them to come to the clinic on time, and it, there's a daily call which helps the patients to actually remember to take their medications. So we have tested that for HIV, for TB, and for COVID-19 surveillance, Uganda used it to actually put their international travelers in quarantine for, 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 for a week before they could actually wander around in Uganda. So in fact, that's working really well. And we have a patient portal on a smartphone because we know that 80% of, uh, you know, of people today in resource limited settings have smartphones. So the world is changing. It's moving from feature phones to smartphones and we definitely need to make sure that our technologies will also help the patients in the future. And, and AI for NTD is an artificial intelligence tool which is capable of actually looking at eggs, parasitic eggs, and that can be used for monitoring and surveilling parasitic infections in resource limited settings as well. So the power of data sciences is also extremely important, from case finding all the way to monitoring retention, adherence, and cure. And along this pathway, we heard Edith, biomarkers and diagnostics, looking at rapid diagnostics, point of care diagnostics, bedside diagnostics. Plenty of them happen in COVID times, and I think we can make a, we can make a, a significant difference for new diseases and old diseases like tuberculosis and leprosy. We are expanding bedaquiline, which is a compound for multidrug resistant TB, which we have. We know that it is bactericidal for mycobacterium leprae, and we want to make sure that we are looking at digital innovation in the leprosy space as well, and that's where we're looking at skin lesion imaging as a clinical outcome, because clinical outcome today is relapse monitoring for five to 10 years. So we're trying to get some of those diseases to go from the dark ages to the molecular ages, and to look at technology and how technology can actually support clinician reported outcomes and primary endpoints in clinical trials as well. So I'm going to stop here, and my request to all of you is, we as a pharmaceutical company rely on public-private partnerships, and I'm hoping that many of you would reach out to me and that we can actually start a conversation to have innovation to impact. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have been talking about the medical issues. We have been talking about the medical perspective. Now we need to talk about the perspective concerning the whole society, because the pandemic is not only a medical question. It's not only a question for the virologist or epidemiologist. It's also a question for those who are dealing with the human society, with the human interactions. That's why I'm very happy that uh, Francisca de Jong, Executive Director of uh, Common Language Resources and Technology Infrastructure, will be joining us on stage. Please. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, thank you very much for your warm welcome. I'm very pleased to be able to contribute to this uh, RI Challenge session with um, an introduction into the way one of the uh, research infrastructures in Europe, one of the uh, S3 landmarks from the domain of the social science and humanities, has taken steps to be able to. Um, inform policymakers, inform citizens, inform developers of uh, medical treatment and healthcare uh, on the events hap that happened during the last pandemic, which may still not be fully over. But in order to be able to deal with the next pandemic that was announced to us uh, just 10 minutes ago, you need to be able uh, to look back uh, on the history of all the dimensions that play a role once such a thing uh, uh, happens and uh, is affecting our lives. Um, um, we, I, I hope to be able to, to tell you how uh, research infrastructures from the social science and humanities domain um, uh, could contribute to, can contribute to uh, the understanding of, of the societal dynamics that we have seen in the past and that may inform future responses should they be needed. So, um, just as context, I'm representing 
a research infrastructure, a pan-European research infrastructure that is uh, providing access to language resources. Uh, it's a consortium of the type ERIC. Uh, it's um, in existence since 2012. We have membership of uh, uh, 22 members, member countries in Europe. Uh, a few more are observer. We also have South Africa as uh, um, uh, a country in our consortium. And the whole thing consists of a distributed network of centers. So we are not a single-sided um, facility. We don't even have data stored at the central uh, hub. We have some central services there, but the data, the language data, the data resources and the, and the tools and services to process language materials are sitting in a, a distributed network of over uh, 60 centers. Many of them are certified by an independent organization called Core Trust Seal, and we have a very strong focus on fairness and interoperability, which means we can um, make use of federated login, central metadata harvesting for easy discovery. Uh, we have change, chained uh, analysis services. The data that we work with exists in many different formats, so written data, spoken data, video material, multimodal stuff, and there's a whole range of analysis tools for the exploration of the data, the combination of data, the annotation, et cetera, et cetera, irrespective of where the materials are sitting. So this is the starting point for um, explaining you what we did with COVID. So one of the things we started organizing some five years ago is making sure that comparable data sets that are available in multiple languages were annotated and curated in such a way that uh, comparable research would be easily possible. So that um, uh, a researcher that wants to do something with a data set in, uh, in Czech and in English and in Spanish would be able to uh, start from harmonized data sets. We do that for many data types. You see a list here. And among this, data, uh, among this list was uh, parliamentary records. Um, and at the start of the COVID pandemic, we easily understood that we would save a lot of money on the fact that we could not travel. And we started to invest that in uh, a specific subset of uh, such a family, uh, such a resource family for the parliamentary uh, records, namely the data covering the data from the parliamentary debates about COVID, about the outbreak of the pandemic, the treatment, uh, the, the, the lockdowns, the, uh, the face masks, um, the conspiracy theories and all that that took place in all parliaments across the world. So this is interesting material to be able to study retrospectively or for other reasons, uh, also to investigate in, in uh, human behavior that may uh, be permanent. And um, we started to make those, those data sets available in a harmonized way. This led, the project was called Parliament. This led in the first stage uh, to a data release uh, for 17 languages, um, many millions of, of words. Um, the entire data set was released through one of um, Clarence Central, um, uh, uh, sorry, th through, the data were deposited in one of Clarence centers, namely Clarence Slovene. Um, uh, but it became accessible through our central discovery platform. And because of the connection with a few other platforms that like to use to work with language data, the material is also explorable without any movement um, through a few other platforms. Because of the success and the enthusiasm across our community, we were able to um, uh, fund another round. Uh, now we have data for uh, 13, from 13 more parliaments being worked on, the period was um, covered was extended so that you could also make comparisons between certain phenomena before COVID and after COVID um, or during COVID. Uh, there was now alignment with speech recordings and translation. There's better documentation and a tutorial for how to use the materials. And recently, um, uh, it's not nice to mention just today, is the um, uh, data for the Ukraine parliament was added. Based on this material that is now available for research, uh, several studies could take place. Me several things come to mind, but of course we, we, we see in those studies um, investigations into frequencies of terms 
or uh, semantic topics, and, and also there are attempts to link this type of data, parliamentary data, with, for example, social media data and other uh, data types. Here you see an image uh, of a, a first investigation that is um, telling something that you all re will remember that, um, that in the first days of, of COVID, we started to become more interested as not as, not as scientists, not as politicians maybe, but as, as uh, the general audience into the opinion and vision of experts. There was the return of experts in public debate. And you can see that if you compare the data from debates before COVID and during COVID, in several uh, countries you see a big rise of the frequency of terminology related to experts. So this is not uh, proving anything, but it's sort of giving the suggestion that that the data that has been collected and the methods applied make sense. The research infrastructure, Clarin, is, is one of the social science and humanities um, uh, research infrastructures in Europe, and we work together as a cluster. Um, so we do that um, by, offer, by offering um, our resources via a model of federation of services, and there is even a common um, discovery platform for the SSH service offer, and that is called the SSH Open Cluster. Um, and we, have, we, have, we work on methodological frameworks and workflows for the analysis of multilingual data, multimedia data, heterogeneous data, mixed methods, etc., all to support research into cultural data, language data, survey data, and, and, and other digital objects. The interesting thing is that because of this cluster model, we are also able to work on multidisciplinary agendas uh, with other clusters in other domains. So here you see an image of the five big research infrastructural clusters that exist in Europe, life sciences, environmental um, studies, uh, uh, astronomy, etc., and uh, the one called PANOS, I'm not going on the details now. But we have, the five clusters have aligned agendas, common, uh, web presence, white papers, uh, etc., with the aim to stimulate cross-disciplinary work. And the example based on Parliament that I would like to show you is the uh, project uh, uh, called MetaCOVID, which is about vocabulary harmonization between uh, uh, domains, between the health domain and the social science and humanities domain. Um, it's, it's a study uh, or a project conducted by the University of Antwerp together with ECRA from the health domain with funding from uh, EOSC Future. And, and here we are developing um, a common ontology that will allow cross-referencing data from, for example, this parliament project and uh, whatever is available in, uh, in the health domain. Um, we apply state-of-the-art machine learning, topic modeling techniques. We integrate them in uh, the topics extracted into uh, this common ontology, and, and we will soon start validating um, the approach to see if, if this would allow for um, digital monitoring of, of public debate, including not just parliamentary data, but also social media data. We have over 200,000 tweets already analyzed for just one language, and in the near future also social survey data, because in the SSH domain, we also have uh, several research infrastructures, such as ESS and SHARE, that work on the collection of social survey data. Thank you. Thank you very much, and please take a seat. Please do not leave me from the stage and take a seat, Francisca. Thank you very much, thank you very much. I would like to ask Edith Hart, as well as uh, our two more panelists to join us on stage so we can discuss what was just said. Uh, Pierre Deslo is joining us, as well as uh, Therese Pateri. Thank you very much. Please take a seat. Ladies, the center of the stage is naturally yours. Mr. Deslo, if I may ask you to take the seat in here, I will sit over there. We have a lighting debate. Are you familiar with lightning debate? Short question, short answer. Let's go for it. Mrs. Hart, please, let's start with you. You said that you were prepared when the pandemic started. How come and how were you prepared? Ha, that's easy. Yeah. Thanks, to, thanks to infrastructure <laughs> sustainability. 
So in fact, let me take the example of the data portal that I mentioned. We already had data portals set up to deal with other topics such mm -hmm. as food security. So it was very easy for us to immediately repurpose um, that data portal to make it a COVID-19 data portal. So for me, that really illustrates it's so important that infrastructures are sustained and that they're kept in a healthy state so they can evolve. Mm -hmm. So I do think that um, an organization like EMBL was actually quite well prepared. I know that um, my colleague said that we weren't prepared. I would argue that at some levels we were actually very well prepared and scientists were thinking about the sharing of data, thinking about the kinds of medications one could use. Of course, one could always be better prepared, <laughs> and I think probably now we will be, but um, yes. What about Short people? Answer. Because a lot of managers concerning not only research infrastructures, but of all of the institutions, they're worried especially about the people. How yeah. to manage the people in the infrastructure, how to manage the organization, how to make it run smoothly, despite what was happening when you could not allow them to meet. How were you prepared and yeah, what, were you, what did you that's, learn? That's interesting. Because EMBL is a multi-site organization, mm -hmm. we, were kind of, we were used to having to deal with people in different places, to interact with them. We already had a lot of online training courses, for example. Mm -hmm. So it was less painful than I thought it would be. It was still a challenge, but we really learned some lessons. For example, mm -hmm. some of our practical courses we managed to do online by sort of taking cameras and showing people what we were doing. Um, and I think also at EMBL, we're a very young organization. We have um, a high turnover because we have a nine-year rule. No one can stay for more than nine years. So we have a lot of young, energetic people who really wanted to help. And I definitely think that helped us in the management side. It's all about people, isn't it? Of course, absolutely. Mrs. Parsons, you, you talked about the cooperation between state and research institutions. What are the lessons learned? What needs to be changed immediately to be prepared for the announced pandemic that is ahead of us. Yeah, I think it's, it's very important to mention that when people, when governments or people or companies or anybody reaches out for help, I think it's important to stand up and provide it. And that is something we as a private organization, as a pharmaceutical company, literally we had to do two, I had to do two jobs, just like 80 other scientists with me. But we didn't shirk it, our management did not say no. Mm -hmm. And I think we, we wanted to make a difference because this was a pandemic setting where everybody had to step up mm -hmm. and deliver. But I think there's a lesson learned out of it. We decided to do that for six months. So we didn't give the government you know, eternal support. We said in six months time, you need to put your act together. Mm -hmm. We'll support you. We'll use our high throughput discovery labs to support you. Mm -hmm. And it came to a state where there were no reagents, no plastics, nothing to buy and there was no structured approach, whereas we being in pharmaceuticals have a structured type process. The first thing before we committed to testing was we actually uh, made sure that we had all the reagents and all the tests available internally, so we bought material upfront, and literally the government bought it back from us after six months because they didn't know where to go looking for it. So it's very important from the lessons learned perspective to try and be prepared as best as possible and we're willing to support, but on a short term, to make sure that we can make a difference. Mm -hmm. Mr. Deslow, you talk about the possibilities for those who are working in research infrastructures to join you in uh, the spending of the money you promised. <laughs> How does the proposal need to look like? How does the proposal need to look like to you can allow it to spend the money together? It's amazing that the only thing that you have, you know, it's not the only thing. You I don't put so. the words in my mouth. No, I will not allow that. <laughs> OK, so I hope that you are not only interested in financing, but also at the results of the research. Which Definitely, is I am. But you need to have you know, the start of the cooperation exactly. to have results. Exactly. So what, just for the sake of transparency, we, we are going to adopt a work plan, mm -hmm. which will be made public in the following weeks where we will describe in this work plan what we want to finance, which kind of actions we, uh, we want to finance, and by which mechanism we want to do it. Not everything, not the one billion will be only for uh, research, because of course we have to do things which are called stockpiling, you know, purchasing some equipment. Uh, also production capacity, it's important that we have a production capacity in Europe, but part of it will be for financing, so it will be made public, and then of course there will be process to select the, the, the right candidates, but again, the point is not about the money. Money is important, I know, because you don't have research without money. I'm not naive. You know, I'm an old man, you know. So I say I, w I was a new kid in time. That was, of course, a metaphor. It was not a reality. But 
but the point being that it's true that it's important also that you come up with ideas. And that's maybe the last message I would like to convey. We need ideas also. We need you to come up with a solution, possible solution, possible way forward. What we lack also sometimes on our side is imagination. So we need you to come up with some ideas. I, don't, I suppose you know something which is called DARPA in the US. Probably not DARPA is uh, uh, something which is being, uh, it's an agency which is being, uh, mm -hmm part of the Ministry of Defense, uh, Department of Defense in the US, which actually creates innovative re research. DARPA. Yeah. DARPA, yeah, yeah. and that's something, you know, and many of the things that you are using have been created in the context of DARPA. And actually the US are going to do similar things for health issues. And we would like to do something similar. So we want also to stimulate innovation. So we don't want simply ideas to come from bureaucrats like me, but we want you to come up with ideas that we could finance. So ARPA is famous, for example, for the competitions for, uh, for robots using the artificial intelligence and yeah. such. So your, your way how to intrigue the research infrastructures will not be put down a paper, put down a lot of papers. No, come up with the idea during something like these events. Yeah. Do I understand you correctly? Yeah. Of course, we are still the European Commission, so you will have a lot of papers, by <laughs> definition. <laughs> That's what I was worried, you know? <laughs> no, let, let, you know, <laughs> but we, tr we, try, we, are we try to be innovative also within the Commission, so we try to find a way maybe to decrease the number of papers. But the point <laughs> is, uh, besides the papers, we need ideas. Mm -hmm. Do they need to? No, sorry. Because I believe that's something, because, you know, we say nobody knows what will be the future health threat. Nobody knows what's mm -hmm. going to happen. So we need to... to, to so nobody has a clue, you know. Uh, we have great experts working with us, you know. We have great mm -hmm. advisors. We have really the most famous people in the field of epidemiology uh, working on biology, working with us. But still, nobody knows for sure. So any idea you could have, any kind of research you would like to, to see, we can, uh, we can think about it. I'm not signing the check today, huh, let's be very clear. But still, <laughs> still, still we, 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 we need those ideas. Uh, I'm asking if there will be the typical paper war, you know. That's what I'm, I'm, I'm afraid. In. I'm afraid. Is but, there? but I have very nice colleagues working at the European Commission here who work uh, for what is called RTD, and they're fully aware of the fact that we need to, to a little bit simplify Horizon Europe because that's still there. So paper battle. It's still <laughs> there, but you know, you never, you, you know, someone said you, you you don't need to hope to undertake something. So let's try to do something which will work. Hera is cooperating with the politicians. You were part also uh, concerning the debates of uh, part of the Czech EU presidency as well, even in the Congress that was organized in the Czech Republic. How do the politicians listen to what is coming from the research infrastructures? First of all, when you talk to, to, to politicians in the current context, first of all, one element which is still very important are the COVID vaccines. Mm -hmm. You know, the debate about the COVID vaccines and the use of COVID vaccines, what to do with them, the fact that we still have quite a, a lot of vaccine is a very important issue, of course, mm -hmm. it's clear, because mm -hmm. it's costly. On the other hand, what I keep saying, you know, it's like an insurance, you know. Every year I pay an insurance for my car. I don't like it because it's expensive, but I need to have this insurance. Otherwise, I will have a problem maybe one day, and then if I don't have an insurance, I will have a problem. So I would say COVID vaccines are the same. Now, with respect to the research community, again, from that point of view, what happens with the COVID vaccine is also interesting because there is now, uh, people are aware of the importance of investing in research, you know. They realize that it's not possible to develop something, especially in the health issue, it's not possible to develop something in six months, actually. So you need to have long-term investment in research. So there is an awareness that more needs to be done in this context, mm -hmm. and also from the Czech presidency, I can say so. Uh, Mrs. Young, uh, do you believe that thanks to, and I'm truly using the word thanks to on purpose, uh, the situation for research infrastructures that concentrate on topics concerning uh, humanities and such will be better? Will it improve? Well, uh, first of all, I think the uh, current um, model in Europe, um, I don't know enough about the situation in the other continents, but in Europe, uh, the model of um, uh, pan-European research infrastructures is now existing uh, for more than 10 years. And um, in all the uh, um, clusters, mm -hmm. to use the word again, so in all the disciplinary domains or groupings of domains, there's a lot of progress and maturity. And uh, definitely now that the uh, SSH community has, has become uh, better organized, uh, that sustainability issues uh, uh, are being addressed, um, there is finally room uh, for collaboration amongst 
We'll just just a little bit, yeah. yeah among, uh, yeah, okay. Thank you, thank you. Uh, amongst the uh, research infrastructure, but, but also with the research infrastructures from the other domains, I think um, um, that uh, th there is a lot of promise also in the collaboration under the header of European Open Science Cloud um, that will definitely make us all aware of the potential for collaboration and it will uh, point uh, us to the strengths and, uh, and the potential contributions and the com complementarity of all mm -hmm. those research infrastructures. Um, so, um, yes, I do see a lot of room, also because uh, in the other domains, it's always clear that for the implementation of uh, smart solutions um, coming from technology or medicine or whatever, you need to understand um, the societal context for the implementation. So I think with a kind of contribution that I just described in my talk, uh, mm -hmm. I could also participate in the next panel. Mm -hmm. Not, uh, I hope to be invited not uh, immediately, but uh, within a no, few we are, <laughs> I'm, I'm just, you know, keeping the seat for you immediately. Yeah. There's no question there. But, but <laughs> definitely in a few years' times, we would also be able to uh, demonstrate uh, how with multilingual approaches for studying human behavior based on parliamentary data, based on social mm -hmm. media, and God knows what new platforms will arise, there will be new materials to study human behavior and to study that in the, in the context of pandemics, but also uh, energy transition, climate pro, uh, transition, sorry, climate change, uh, yeah. change uh, migration uh, uh, problems, etc. Mm. Rosie Hicks is asking, do you feel the pandemic has reduced reluctance, reluctance to share data? Will it last? What do you think? I think um, the pandemic showed us that we had to share data, but it also showed us where the limitations were. So I do think that there was um, a realization that trust and building trust is absolutely essential. Mm -hmm. So I believe that Europe was able to actually rise up to that challenge and there was more collaborative effort and more trust built than ever before, perhaps, in, in sharing data. But nevertheless, there are still big challenges. and. I think there has to be a, a, a realization that we need to have you know, global standards in the way human data can be accessed. And that's something where EMBL is, is quite active in trying to help promote that. And I think if we do have standards and we do build up trust and we communicate this with the public, we'll be in a much better place. And you know, the next thing that will challenge us and perhaps kill us may not be another pathogen. It could be something to do with the impact of climate change on our biodiversity and the fact that, you know, some people mm -hmm. are not going to be able to eat anymore where mm -hmm. they're living. But being able to get that data, you know, what's happened, what can we do about it, and can we share that in a very rapid and, I would say, sensible and responsible way, I think that really is something that we've learned thanks to this pandemic. And it's necessary to say that the British scientists were upfront concerning sharing data, concerning the genomic, uh, yes. genome data of, yeah. uh, of SARS-CoV-2, because half of what was shared worldwide was shared by the British. That's right. And I should say it was actually EMBL that helped that. I, I knew European. you would edit, yeah. <laughs> I did an interview with a colleague of yours. It was amazing. And I do have to say that also the, the backstage was quite intriguing because the system was prepared very nicely and could be an inspiration, I would say, for future projects as well. I just want to add on the data sharing component. It's not only, it's, it's also important to look at sharing of data, but also look at what's available out there with regards to population densities, mm -hmm. hotspots, you know, uh, vector bone transmission. Uh, we'll have to look at how the vect, you know, how the mosquito is traveling, you know, what are the different types of reservoirs, uh, geospatial networks. So every component and every aspect that way we can actually build those federated data networks will help us to, you know, build outbreak prediction models and get us better prepared for, you know, for, mm. for, 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 uh, war for times. what's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> Final word of our <laughs> lightning debate. The thing you want to, to everybody to remember. Mr. Deslo. I would simply always look at the bright side of life and it's... <laughs> And it's better to be... Yeah, I'm not I would like you. to stress <laughs> out that the party is tomorrow, not today, okay? And, okay, <laughs> and, and simply just better to be safe than sorry. Pierre Deslon, Director General of HERA. Thank you very much. <laughs> Please, Teresa Pateri. For me, it's all about scientific talent development in the Global South. 
I think it's very important that if we want to have a, you know, act locally, but think globally. That's very important for us in the future. Teresa Pateri, Vice President, Head of Disease Management, Public Programs of Janssen Pharmaceutica. Thank you very much indeed. Edith Hart. So for me, it's that science matters. I think everyone has realized, and we should be thanking scientists every day of our lives today, because we're here, and we're able to sit here thanks to the discovery-driven research that happened over decades and decades. And so science matters, and we must really not forget that. Whatever crisis is hitting us, us be it economic or otherwise. So that's my message. Science really matters. Director General of European Molecular Biology Laboratory, Edith Hart. Thank you very much. Yeah. The floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there was a great effort by um, uh, by the scientists working in the health domain to, to, to get um, the puzzle solved and to get the vaccines available. For the surveillance of the patients, for the communication with uh, the communities and the citizens, it's very important to pay attention to cultural diversity and therefore also to uh, multilinguality. So I would like to argue for continuous uh, interest and, and support for multilinguality uh, in the multidisciplinary context that we, that we uh, have to maintain. Says Executive Director of Clarine Eric, Francisca de Jong. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for taking part in uh, this plenary and in this debate. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed. And you are keeping the seat. It's not about all. Thank you very much. I will call you up uh, during the next debate that is up to us because we will open up the next topic. On the big screen, thanks to Bea, you can actually check out what has happened. To remember, you, to you can truly remember what was happening during the first part of this plenary. So you can recall everything that was said in a nice way. So you can keep everything in mind. You don't need to worry if we are a little bit late concerning the ending of the second, uh, second topic today, because everything is prepared and everything is secured concerning your, concerning your transportation as well, because some of you will join us for uh, the sessions for the program that is prepared here at uh, Passage Hotel. The site events are starting at 7 p.m. on the first floor. Some of you are leaving for, uh, the, for different locations. If you are leaving uh, to Masaryk University campus and the uh, recital events, meaning that the opening of Sales Park Biobank, the bus will be leaving from Hotel Continental. It will be leaving just after quarter past six, but it will wait for you, so you don't need to worry that you will miss the bus, so you can be absolutely, absolutely uh, okay. And bus to Brno Observatory, the dinner hosted in cooperation by the Extreme Light Infrastructure, Eric, and Laser Lab Europe uh, will be, the bus will be ready at Hotel International at 8.30 and 8.50. You can learn more naturally at the registration, as well as in the app ERI20. 2022, where everything is written down in the news, so you will not miss a beat at all. Now we will concentrate on the second topic I have uh, promised to talk about, environment, climate change and mitigation. We will also talk about the data that are necessary to make and to have to be absolutely certain that we have a relevant discussion. We are starting uh, with a talk about some of the most closely watched and closely followed data in the world. Former Dean of the College of Earth, Ocean and Atmospheric Sciences at Oregon State University, nowadays Director of the Office of Polar Programs, U.S. National Science Foundation, will be the first speaker in this part of the conference. In this role, she oversees the portfolio of NSF's science and infrastructure investments in the Arctic, Antarctica and the Southern o Ocean that enable discovery and innovation in polar regions. Roberta Marinelli is on stage. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. This is my second time in the Czech Republic in, uh, in four months, and it's just a beautiful country, and I feel very fortunate to be invited here. I am going to uh, turn your attention to the ends of the earth, to the polar regions, and, uh, but only if I can advance this slide. There we go. Okay. Um, what you are seeing right now is um, a recent publication that shows uh, global climate tipping points for approximately 16 regions of the planet. These regions are either ecosystems or processes that are, are, are occurring. And what I want you to note is that 11 of the 16 regions of concern are in polar regions, either the Arctic or the Antarctic. And when we refer to tipping points, we refer to 
a change that's happening where if you reverse the causes of the change, the system doesn't go back to its previous state. So it enters a new state, uh, which we all then have to adapt to. Now, unfortunately, um, what happens in polar regions doesn't stay in polar regions because they're part of a global system. And the air that, that traverses polar regions, the waters that circulate around them are connected to the rest of the Earth. And so they affect us all uh, in a number of very important ways. I've listed just a few here that are um, also on the previous slide. For example, ice loss in Greenland and Antarctica, particularly West Antarctica, are are on the watch list as events that could significantly increase global sea level rise. The warming and freshening of polar oceans through melting of glaciers and, uh, and ice caps could affect global ocean circulation, which affects the heat distribution across the entire globe. And then uh, if you go to uh, the, the frozen ground, particularly in the Arctic region, which is called permafrost, it has a lot of carbon buried in it. And as that ground melts, which it's doing, um, then uh, carbon starts to decompose, and that decomposed carbon eventually turns into carbon dioxide and possibly methane, which escapes to the atmosphere, which increases more warming, which increases more composition, decomposition. So it's a very undesirable positive feedback loop. And, and critically, the polar regions are warming really three to four times faster than the rest of the globe. And the way we know this is because of the observations and the experiments that we've conducted to understand critical rates of change, um, see where the impacts are, and hopefully develop mitigation and adaptation measures. But the scales of observation um, are vast because the polar regions are vast, and it's challenging because they're unpopulated, and they require a range of very specialized tools. So we've talked a little bit about um, policy underpinnings and international collaboration, and I want to take a, a short trip into that territory. Um, as uh, in my current position, I oversee both the Arctic research and the uh, Antarctic research programs. And the U.S. Antarctic Research Program, which is operated by the National Science Foundation, stems from our signing of the Antarctic Treaty in 1959. And for those of you who are not familiar, the Antarctic Treaty is, um, uh, preserves the continent for peaceful purposes and for scientific research. And in 1982, President Ronald Reagan um, set forth a memorandum that established the U.S. Antarctic Program and assigned it to the NSF. And the goal was to um, establish three permanent research stations, including one at the South Pole, and it required the National Science Foundation to oversee polar research on behalf of all U.S. agencies. Our Arctic research programs operate somewhat differently. Um, it was established um, in part by the Arctic Research Policy Act of 1984, and it is research about the Arctic in, in any, uh, uh, any area. Um, the Arctic Research Policy Act also established a commission and a policy committee, and collectively those two bodies work with the National Science Foundation and other agencies to coordinate a research agenda for the Arctic. And just a couple of weeks ago, the government, uh, the Biden administration, released a national strategy for the Arctic region uh, that included research as part of its agenda, as well as other political and national security concerns, as you might imagine. Now, um, we also interact internationally because of the intense um, involvement of many nations in both the Arctic and in the Antarctic, but they have different governance structures. So many of you are probably familiar with the Arctic Council, which is the eight nations that have territory bordering in the Arctic region. And uh, they work together collectively to, um, to uh, achieve science goals, among many other things. And in the Antarctic, um, the Secretariat of the Antarctic Treaty holds annual meetings, and that is also a forum for collaboration on the use of the continent and also many aspects of the science that, um, that are conducted. However, periodically political um, complications arise, as you might imagine. Uh, the Russia-Ukraine conflict has put a halt to a number of the Arctic Council interactions. And on the Antarctic side, while the treaty asks us to hold territorial claims in abeyance, and we generally do, periodically um, there are nations that actually make claims and we have to tiptoe around them as we go forth and chart science agendas. 
So I want to just take a quick trip through some of the common or uncommon infrastructure that we need in polar regions to accomplish our goals. Um, and they also make for really, really great pictures. What you see on the left here, yes, that's the correct orientation, is a science traverse. We have science traverses and also um, operational traverses, and these end up being far more effective and, uh, in terms of fuel consumption and our ability to get to different places on the continent relative to airlift. Um, and so increasingly, we've relied on science traverses to carry out work in remote regions. However, on the uh, bottom right, you see a ski-equipped um, cargo plane. Uh, there are only 10 of these in the world, and this is also a, a workhorse for uh, work in polar regions, both the Arctic and the Antarctic. We have helicopters, which we uh, use uh, considerably, and also specialized ships, both to supply stations, but also to break ice, and we have research icebreakers as well. Now, the different regions require very different approaches to research infrastructure. In the Antarctic, because there is no population, you have to bring everything there or build it once you get there. So the three permanent bases um, serve as, as focal areas of activity that are supplied annually by vessels, but there are also a number of satellite camps that we uh, set up to do specific research projects, many of which are climate related, although some uh, relate to astronomy as well, and for those of you who think about astronomy more, you're probably aware that South Pole Station is a significant astronomy hub. But we also have strong relationships with international partners through the Council of Managers of National Antarctic Programs, which meets annually, and they have an, a number of relationships where they collaborate on capabilities and infrastructure so that they can mutually support one another in case of emergencies and on joint science goals. It's a very productive interaction. In the Arctic, um, the strategy is somewhat different since there are many communities to work with and there are um, options for partnering with local vendors and significant interactions with local communities including indigenous communities. So we have only one small base at the top of the Greenland ice sheet. However, a number of small camps um, in near to local communities, which, um, which really helps us tremendously carry out a number of different um, and diverse research projects. And the uh, infrastructure collaboration in the Arctic tends to happen through the Forum of Arctic Research Operators called FARO. And just a few more pictures. This is what the Amundsen Scott South Pole Station looks like. That was shortly after it was constructed. It's uh, accumulating quite a bit of snow right now, which is why it's on, um, on stilts, if you will, and there is an ability to lift the station up as snow accumulates. And then on the right is McMurdo Station, which is a former Navy base, as you might imagine. It kind of looks that way, but it's undergoing a significant refurbishment um, in the next few years. And then here are some of the field camps. Uh, on the left is a particularly large one on the West Antarctic Ice Sheet, which was set up for multiple years in a row to look at the West Antarctic Ice Sheet um, dynamics. And then on the right is a much smaller field camp, more temporary in the Antarctic uh, Dry Valleys. So what are our future foci for polar observing? We're very focused on advanced ships so that we can penetrate areas where we know that uh, climate change um, or indicators of climate change are occurring, but we can't get there with our current icebreakers. We're interested in new satellites that cover broad areas so that we can observe without having to be there. And the re remaining items on this list, smart cables for um, undersea data collection, autonomous ve vehicles in the ocean and in the atmosphere, the development of new sensors, and increasingly batteries that allow you to collect data in forbidding circumstances um, that actually last. But we're also, um, as mentioned earlier, very strongly partnered with others who are working in polar regions. A critical uh, component for all of us is shared data management systems and also a global consensus on gap analysis. There's a lot of climate change research that gives us indications of what's happening, but a lot of things that we don't know. And the more that we work together to understand where the critical gaps are and to try to fill them, the more effective we will be at understanding rates of change and developing strategies to, to uh, really to mitigate and adapt. This also includes human capital development, where possible the participation of communities, and also the development of models that pull all of this data together. And modeling is 
a very complex exercise in and of itself with new mathematical techniques being developed and um, increasingly uh, critical for climate projections. So that's all I have. And uh, I guess I'll see you uh, at the, uh, after the next set of speakers. Definitely so. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And the next speaker is, uh, is a meteorologist by training in this very case. Meteorologist by training, meaning that she focuses uh, mainly on cloud microphysics modeling. Now she is the managing director of the South African Environmental Observation Network of National Research Foundation. On stage is right now coming Mary Jane Bopate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, good morning, good afternoon, <laughs> and good evening to everybody, mm -hmm. uh, those that are online and everybody in the room. Uh, I just want to thank the organizers for inviting me to contribute to this discussion on climate change. I'm going to take the time that I have to share with you work that we are doing at the South African Environmental Observation Network. We, we are a business unit of the National Research Foundation, and we are funded by the Department of Science and Innovation. So Imran Patel, who was a part of the first session, represented that, 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 um, that department. And our vision is to provide world-class environmental research platforms for a sustainable society. I thought I'll, I'll show you this picture here, which shows you the type of challenges we are dealing with when we talk about um, environmental observations. So these are the weather observations. Um, so the, I don't know if there's a pointer here. Let's see, yeah, it works. So this one here shows you the observations that were sent from across the whole globe to the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting um, yesterday. And the other side that shows you these observations that have been sent over years and years to the European set are then taken together to produce a long-term observation network. And you can see these are very much um, similar to each other. And you can see the gaps are very obvious. You look at the African um, continent, there are big gaps. And when you look at the, the Southern Hemisphere in general, there are very big gaps when it comes to the observation networks. So we say uh, satellite information will help, and this is just to show you some of the challenges. I know the slide is busy, but if you just look at the example on this side, so this is for Botswana, the one in the middle is Zambia, and then the one um, on the right, that is Namibia. So just focusing on the Botswana one, uh, what we are looking at there is rainfall um, observations over a 24-hour period on a specific day, so, and all those are called observations. So you've got first the ground observation, so that is really what you can call the ground truth. And then the next one here, this next one is, is a um, NASA product, the one that's written IMEC is a NASA product, and the one below is a University of Reading product. So all of these are observations, and then on the left we've got the ERA-5, which we consider as the best reanalysis in the world. So now assume you want to run a model, and you are asking the question, what rainfall was received on this particular day? So all these are your observations, and you can see we have some real challenges, because that is, those are, these are satellite products that have to be calibrated with, with ground observations, and if you do not have ground observations to calibrate your satellite uh, products, you end up with a situation like this where you just don't know if it rained or not. Uh, so I'll speak to what we are doing now at Scion. Scion has um, seven offices distributed, um, seven nodes distributed across the country. We've got four nodes that are focusing on the terrestrial sciences, and we have got two nodes that focus on, on the marine sciences, and we have one node based in Cape Town that focuses on our ICT as well as our um, you know, the provision of data um, uh, products. And we are hosting three research infrastructures that I'll speak to later. So uh, being distributed across the country allows us to have landscapes that we can focus on and do some in-depth research and understand what is happening in those different landscapes. And what that map is showing you there 
uh, are areas where we've got landscapes where we do some localized in-depth research on what is happening. So we look at what's happening in the atmosphere, we look at what changes in vegetation, we look at the hydrology, um, and therefore we are well positioned to facilitate multi-institutional research and you know catalyze global change research. And our infrastructure is available for the scientists from across um, you know the world to to use. Um, when, when Imran was, was talking earlier, he talked about the South African uh, Research Infrastructure Roadmap. Uh, there's a real program which was launched in, in 2016. So there are 13 research infrastructures that are being implemented across South Africa, and five of those focus on the environment. And within Scion, we are implementing three of these. So we've got the first one called um, FTON, which focuses on the terrestrial sciences. So the types of observations we are taking, uh, you know, the atmospheric sciences, like, uh, you know, the meteorology, we want to know what's happening with rainfall, what's happening with temperature. We are interested in atmospheric chemistry. We are interested in the hydrology, as I've mentioned, with water, what is the water quality like, uh, how much water um, is, is available. And we are also interested in how we are engaging with, with the environment and you know how um, like the effect, impacts of, of mining, for example. Then we've got a second one which focuses on shallow marine and, and the coast. Uh, we call it SMECRI. It is really in, 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 the, in its mature stage. There are 15 platforms that are available from that, that, um, that particular research infrastructure. And we have been able to train more than 150 postgraduate students um, from that particular research infrastructure. Then we've got the South African Polar Research um, Infrastructure, and with that particular one, we want to be able to take observations of what's happening within the deep oceans, and we are interested in Antarctica as well, we are interested in the islands as well. So when you look at all the three research infrastructures that we are looking at, that means you know, uh, within science we're able to do multidisciplinary research, uh, because you know the environment, or for you to be able to um, forecast climate or to do climate change projections, you actually need to be running earth system models with all these processes being represented in, in the models. Um, we, we also have a team, I uh, mentioned we have seven nodes, so I, we've got a seventh node that's based in Cape Town that focuses on um, providing a data platforms. So, so we've got a, 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 a portal um, where people can go and download our data. So what we are doing, we follow fair principles. Uh, our data, you can find it. You don't need to engage with us to get access to our data. You can find it on the website and you can, you can download it. So this is just an example of a platform that is available. We've got one on the South African Risk and Vulnerability Atlas. We've got a system for the, for the marine sciences and we are also working with a sister department of DSI called Department of Forestry, Fisheries and the Environment, uh, where they are developing a platform that uh, uh, for, for climate services. So all these are available and, and Scion is able to, to develop these. And in, in that case, we are able to bridge the gap from saying we are collecting the data as well as to provide the services to make the data available to the scientists. Uh, the, this area that we work in, I think generally we refer to it, uh, the people working in it, we refer to them as people with scarce skills. Therefore, we've got a really strong outreach program that we are running where within the nodes that we are located in, we also work with the schools, uh, we work with educators, we work with school learners, so that we can increase the number of, uh, of learners that you know when they go to university, they study marine sciences, they study atmospheric sciences, all, all the um, environmental related areas, because what they know is you know they need to do engineering and, and, and others. <laughs> But then, uh, so once you start engaging with them, then they become aware of, of, of um, these disciplines that, that we are talking about here today. Uh, we, we are also engaging globally, and Scion is a founding uh, member, in fact, of the uh, Global Ecosystem Research Infrastructure. So those different colors show you uh, different research infrastructures that signed an MOU on 8 December. Uh, 2020, so that so we were agreeing to basically um, collaborate on issues around the the environment, and um, this um, 
research infrastructure is making it possible for us to engage formally. And out of this uh, group, we've actually, we already have a, a project that, is, that has been funded successfully by the European Union. And we are working on, on, another, on another proposal, so through this next, so it's, it is making it possible for us to really collaborate in an efficient way. Uh, this is my last slide, but it's, it's really to show you that the challenges that we are dealing with are multidisciplinary, as I've mentioned to you. If you want to produce seasonal forecasts, a state-of-the-art model will couple the atmosphere with, with the ocean. If you want to project climate, you also want to have a model that runs where you know, the ocean is coupled with the atmosphere. At the same time, you want a land surface that is changing because as climate is changing, the vegetation will also change. So you want a dynamic um, land surface model. And what the slide is also showing you is that we are dealing with things at different scales. So the, you've got the one uh, globe, it shows you, like, you need to run a global model and you need information, you need observations across the whole globe. The other one shows you that uh, to be able to get information at high resolution, you do want to zoom in, and as, as you are zooming in uh, with your models, you also want the observations to be at, at high resolution like that. And, and I mean, we've got mechanisms, I think, around modeling uh, with what we call dynamical downscaling. And then the other one, it shows you a very big computer we have in, in South Africa uh, from the Center for High Performance Computing. It just shows you that if people do not have those types of resources, they are not able, they are not going to be able to be able to, they're not going to be able to make the types of projections that those that have these available resources to them. So it's just um, for us to think about, um, you know, as we are deploying research infrastructures to think about are these available for everyone else. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much. We will go on with a presentation of a conservation scientist who is also a mathematician who held positions in university, public as well as non-profit organizations. He participated in development of software that was first used to rezone the Great Barrier Reef and now is used in almost every country to make sure that uh, the information concerning the expansion of marine and terrestrial protected area systems are well kept on. Terrestrial Eco Ecosystem Research Network Advisory Board Chair and a professor of the University of Queensland. It is Hugh Possingham who has the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dan. <laughs> I'm glad I followed Mary Jane because she said most of what I'm going to say, but she did it so much better. So I can just sort of go extemporaneous and say what I like. And let me actually start by connecting the first two of these sessions. So I think it was Pierre who maybe has rushed away, said there were three learnings from the pandemic. I'm going to add a fourth learning from the pandemic, which nobody's really talked about. What we talked about in that previous session was all about curing. When the next, pan when the next pandemic happens, what are we going to do? Where do most of these pandemics come from? They come from nature. They come from the environment. They come from unfortunate human interactions with the environment. So, prevention is better than cure, right? Always, at least 10 to 100 times better than cure. Pandemics last 10 years, climate change lasts 100 years, biodiversity loss will suffer that for a million years. We're talking about much bigger things. If we really want to stop another pandemic, we would stop deforestation and we'd change the way we interact with animals. We'd probably all go vegan but um, I'm not willing to do that at the moment. Um, that if we did all go vegan in the entire planet and we stopped deforestation, I can guarantee you the number of pandemics would more than halve, would be down to 20 or 30% of what we have. So uh, I'm, I'm trying to encourage the artists to draw lines between the two sides and just say the health of humanity is a subset of the health of the environment, which is what this section is all about. It is often said, it is pretty obvious, but for some reason we often forget that that is the cheapest and fastest way to stop problems in human health and stop people dying. Um, I'm very lucky to have helped set up our Terrestrial Environmental Research Network. You heard earlier from Cathy Foley, who's the Chief Scientist of Australia, and she talked about our 20 National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Schemes. This is just one of them. 
and it's interesting, I was there at the beginning and now I'm the chair of the board, uh, and I'm just going to talk about a few observations of the complexities of dealing with environmental science, but many of the themes are Mary Jane's already nicely introduced. How do you work across complicated spatial scales? So much of the research infrastructure we've talked about already today, there is a synchrotron. It's an enormous big thing. There's a, a one kilometre array. Uh, there is a database. But in the environment, we've got a problem of that there's thousands, well, there's eight million species on the planet. There's so many ecological processes. And as Mary pointed out, it's all about spatial scale. And I'd also like to acknowledge the director of TURN who who um, put together these slides. So this is very similar to what Mary Jane showed. This is how the terrestrial ecological research network in Australia works, but it's quite similar to many other places. We have these 17 uh, super sites, 17 places where we measure everything we possibly can in great detail. There's flux towers there, there's biodiversity monitoring, they're counting every plant in one or two hectare sites. But you can't do that across a continent that's the size of Europe, uh, seven million square kilometres everywhere, obviously. So then we have another thousand sites that we're measuring a subset of those things, core things like soil and water and vegetation, but we're not going to measure the ants everywhere, or we'll try and measure some. We're not going to measure all the biodiversity and the fungi and all the ecological processes. And then we go up to satellite data, satellite data where we try and integrate all these things and learn. And of course, um, most countries have put the, many countries have put these systems together. Uh, and they've put them together often in similar ways, but not always in similar ways. So really the big thing is what Mary Jane talked about, is how do you get everybody to cooperate? And there already is a system of cooperating across a set of countries, the Global Ecosystem Research Infrastructure Network, uh, there it's mapped. Um, and Basically, it's a matter of getting these different countries and organisations to agree on collecting similar kinds of data in similar kinds of way and sharing all that data. So the other big theme here is sharing. I, I once tweeted that any scientist who collected data and didn't make it publicly available within a couple of years was, uh, was committing a criminal act. I got a little bit of hate, hate email after that. But really, to be honest, 98, you know, could be well over 50% of the data collected by scientists in, in the ecosystem world, in the ecology world, we know often dies in the cabinet, the filing cabinet of that scientist. Unpublished, uncurated, not in an electronic database. And I think we know that. Uh, we're working hard to improve it. There have been major steps to improve it. But even if it is gathered together in a database, it's often incompatible and nobody fully knows the metadata is incorrect. So this is one of the big steps and I think some of these platforms are very important. The other thing I'd sort of say as a commentary about environmental science, when they came to me initially to create this network, they said, well, the astronomers have said there's three big questions in astronomy, and the physicists have said there's five big questions in... What are the three big questions in environmental science? Australia has about 25,000 environmental scientists, and I would say they each of them had three big questions, and none of them are the same. <laughs> so the term herding cats, getting actually environmental scientists to cooperate on what data to collect, how to store it, how to analyse it, uh, what software to use to analyse it, I have to say is, is, is sometimes a very challenging problem. But we have this structure in the middle here, the Global Ecosystem Research Infrastructure Network. I think there's some people in this, in this audience here who are representing that and I think um, uh, uh, providing a valuable service and hopefully eventually goes global. I'd also like to say, for example, our sites, because we are one of the continents, um, it's often used by NASA to validate their satellite data because we have field observations in a thousand sites. The carbon, the flux towers we have all across the continent are used for these global climate change models. So if you didn't have data across these places, then you wouldn't be able to build decent climate change models. And I'll give you one specific example of that in a minute. So I'd urge you to look at uh, this particular paper which came out in 2020. It's a paper that talks about that global cooperation in research infrastructure for the environment. It's how they're working out how to get things together. It's a relatively new thing. And obviously, it's always going to take time because 
again, I said every environmental scientist had their own three questions and none were the same. Every country's invented different methods. I'll give you an example. One of the methods, we have a method for assessing the condition of vegetation in Australia and every state has invented a different method, every single state. So I would love to see a map of the world's vegetation condition but, of course, almost no country agrees on how to measure vegetation condition. Why would I like that map? Because we have carbon trading. Within 10 years, by 2030, the, the biodiversity trading market may be as big as the carbon trading market. How are we going to trade in biodiversity if we have no consistent measure of how, what vegetation condition and quality is? We have no consistent way of measuring biodiversity in any location. So we can never trade in biodiversity so we can never get the benefits that the market to deliver in terms of biodiversity trading as we have with carbon trading. So these are important issues. Um, all our data is now flowing through these international networks, is hopefully fully available, again, uh, to all those scientists that want to use it in any form possible. And we know that everybody's using it because the 2,000 publications that have used TURN data in the last decade are being used by people all over the planet in cooperative research endeavours. Um, I would also briefly like to end with a couple of points and save us some time. Uh, a lot of the, what I'm talking about is in the ICRI app because the, our terrestrial environmental ecosystem research network has a little booth in the app and I'd urge you to look at those booths. People often say, uh, you know, why are you looking at birds and the environment and the cl climate and weather? And I say, Indigenous Australians, 5, 000, for 50,000 years, there wasn't a single Indigenous Australian who was not observing the environment. How did it get to a point where we have so many people living in this world, in Australia and Europe, who never look at the environment? It's a strange thing, isn't it? People say, you're a bird watcher, that's a weird thing to do. And now I say, you're not a bird watcher, that's a really weird thing to do. How could you not be a bird watcher? And I'll end on this point which am amplifies what Mary Jane, and you know, she may be able to tell me whether this is true or not, but the importance of this global network of data is, believe it or not, the forecasting for European weather is, is somewhat limited by the lack of data on the ocean temperature, uh, fluxes in the atmosphere from northern Australia where there are very few Australians and, and areas in Melanesia and Polynesia and New Guinea where there isn't a lot of environmental data being collected. So I suppose my point, one of my other points which hasn't come up a lot today is we all have our responsibility. Australia can build all these networks and flux towers and super sites but our responsibility now is to help Micronesia, Melanesia, Polynesia, all our near neighbours, Indonesia, build those same networks of environmental uh, data gathering. Thank you. Hugh Postingham, I do believe a bird watcher, am I right? No question there. Before we go to uh, the lightning debate, we will concentrate on one more talk, a talk of a man who whose scientific expertise is mainly in river, delta, lagoon and coastal sedimentology and morphology with a focus on coastal dynamics. He is coordinator of International Centre for Advanced Studies on River Sea Systems, Danubius Research Infrastructure. It is Adrian Stanika. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you all for your patience. I realise I'm the last speaker of the day which is not quite the best thing. So when we had a preparation of this session, I was looking at the uh, different questions and topics, and I was ready to start saying, and now for something completely different. Actually, it's not quite that, because all the speeches have important points, and they have been excellent and revealing information for me, and not just for me, I think that for most of the people in this room and online. What I'm going to do is to present our experience in the recent years when building a pan-European research infrastructure dedicated to interdisciplinary research of river sea systems. So data interoperability has been always a big debate. 
but for us has been at the core of our activities. Why? Uh, first of all, Danubius RI is not about the Danube. It's an idea that started in the Danube, more precisely, Lower Danube, Danube Delta, Black Sea system, and it has been an initiative accepted in 2016 on the S3 roadmap to build a distributed pan-European research infrastructure providing interdisciplinary science to river sea systems. So looking mainly at hydrographic basins that include also the sea under the influence of the river waters and to deal with proper management in order to uh, find solutions to combine impacts from climate change and human interventions in the basin, looking again at water, sediments, ecosystem issues. So what does it mean? It means that we have been, way, we're still in, uh, under, under construction, if you want. We aim to bring together different scientific communities, so to bring together life scientists, earth scientists, physical scientists, engineers, social and economic scientists, and to bring together significant uh, research domains, so experts in freshwater with experts from the marine domain covering an area which has been not very much focused on during the recent decades, the transitional environments, deltas, estuaries, and lagoons. So this means providing scientific services that cover the way from understanding, gathering the knowledge, and coming to get the wisdom how to manage river sea systems. And this is translated into providing scientific services that deal with observation, so earth observation and in situ measurements, analysis of sampling collecting, numerical model to get the conceptual understanding and testing decision systems, management, DSS systems in the rivers and the seas under their influence. And this again is translated into the four excellence nodes that have been building uh, our services in the recent years. From observation, the observation node, analysis node, modeling and the impact nodes. So at the heart of our plan when we started working for this was to develop Danubius Commons, which has been our glue, because it all comes to linguistics and different understanding. We decided to have a common understanding, to have harmonized method, methods, protocols, instruments, to have compatible, practically, methodologies in all the aspects from sampling collection to data acquisition, storage, availability, and so on. So this has been the greatest challenge. It's actually a never-ending story. This is nevertheless the most important thing that needs to be done in order to provide excellent services in a unique way. And the commons that we have been working on continuously in the past six years, and it's a never-ending story, as I said, cover all the aspects from internal management to the way we can offer our services. And so we come to the interoperability. Uh, so data, we are looking at very complex types of data, from digital data to non-digital data. We look at earth observation. We look at in situ sampling. Um, collecting, storing, all the types of data. We talk about data processing. So we have been blessed that we have started and we continue to work to develop this initiative, this distributed research infrastructure, in these days when we have been so fortunate to have these international, international and European programs. So the European Space Agency has provided us a significant series of, of background information and we found many solutions for what we needed to find and agree on. Then the uh, marine uh, databases like the EMODNET, Sea Data Net, these in significant initiatives have been of high support. EU MedSat and other already operational initiatives have been uh, fundamental for us to be able to progress. 
We have been dealing with the nodes and 10 super sites in 10 European countries, and it has not been easy, but we have managed to come and plan how to deal with the data, how to have common metadata standards, how to have common formats, how to do the data storage. All these have been significant parts that we had discussed, not always friendly discussions, I guess you realize, but what's important is the result in the end. We have plans that show that being adaptable is the key to progress and where we want to get. So it's not just about the data collection, and I'm very happy that people speaking behind me spoke about the complexity and the significant resources needed uh, for the modeling, for the numerical modeling. And one of the most significant aspects has been the integration of in situ and Earth observation data with the modeling data. And uh, the modeling node has been leading with experts from our, all our partner institutions um, in a very difficult way because from a point of view, internally in the internal cuisine, you need a very complex system. You need complex system that bring together different types of models. I'm not a modeler myself, but I know it's complicated. I know the other side. What they needed to do is the need for simplicity. So to deliver a product that can be understood and can be used by most of the people looking also at decision makers, policy makers, and why not the wider public. And again, looking at the vast work behind, it has not been easy and we are still progressing, but quite optimistic. Then again, talking about the fortune that we have, we consider ourselves fortunate. Um, one of our key elements of success has been our being included in a Horizon 2020 project and referred that brought together the other European environmental research infrastructures. They are here, many of these colleagues who have supported our colleagues who are data experts to learn from them. So I'm talking about mature environmental research infrastructures, ERICS. And, uh, this has been a very important thing, and I consider that my colleagues uh, who are data experts manage to learn from them and to learn also from their mistakes. Of course, you realize we'll be able to make our own mistakes and be original, but this will come a bit later, I guess. So, what we have been trying to do is to contribute in our way to developing the digital twin ocean, which is so extremely important, but the ocean is not disconnected from the mainland. So we have been trying to come with this support that brings together Earth observation, in situ data, measurements of all types, in a way that generates knowledge and understanding of river sea systems looking from top of the mountain to the deeper part of the seas. And this is one example of a, a very difficult and complex effort done by our British colleagues on the uh, fourth super site of Danubius RI. But there are similar efforts, less advanced in place, through the Horizon 2020 DOORS project together with colleagues from other European research infrastructures dedicated to the environment. We're trying to deliver a similar thing also to the Black Sea. And, and the river basins around it. And uh, that's it for now. Thank you, thank you very much. And please do not hesitate to take the seat because I would like to ask uh, Roberta Marinelli to join us on stage as well, as well as Mary Jane Bopate and Nature Lehew, uh, Possingham to join us on stage as well. Do we have the whole panel ready for the lightning debate? I would like to start, Mr. Stanica, Stanica, with you, because you mentioned the collaboration concerning sharing the data as well. Who are the stakeholders that you are cooperating with? To whom are you making sure that you can provide the data? Well, Please yes. grab the microphone, if you may. Thank you. Yeah, yeah now it's it working. Works. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So we closer to the mouth, please. Yeah, but I have a very strong voice. So Don't worry about it. They will manage. Okay, so if you I break it, it's okay. if I break your ass, it's not my fault, it's his fault. Yeah, it's my fault, I okay. take it. So, well, we are really looking at several categories of stakeholders, mm -hmm. and this is why our colleagues try to prepare the data 
uh, let's say in a tailored way. So first is the scientific community, mm -hmm. which is in, involved in this. So we are talking about the different categories of researchers. A second, and very much related to this, is the category of future scientists, and not just in future professionals. Research infrastructures have a major role in education, so we are preparing also to deliver these training programs and they need to understand not just the data, but also the metadata, so what's behind the data, to learn how to gather information and how to use it. But what we are doing is also that we try to uh, relate as much as possible with the policy makers and decision makers. And here we come to the, uh, uh, it's the river basin management committees and, and um, we are preparing to discuss not just with them, let's say also with local decision makers to show them that we can provide excellent services and that we can find answers to their questions. So. As I said, it's still work in progress, but this is something that we are preparing to do because there we're going to need, um, they have generally very focused questions and they don't want to hear things like, mm, in 20 years I'll tell you. We need to prepare very precise, very clear and direct answers. So and get it now. Yes, and get it now. So looking at ways how to adapt everything. And then is the part which is extremely important is to show people that we exist and that we try to address a significant challenge worldwide and and this is the way how we 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 prepare to pack you know the information for the uh, wider audiences what about the private sector because you mentioned the cooperation with for example a european space agency and it's uh, it's offering a lot of data that is being used by uh, the private sector concerning describing the gdp of various countries in the world concerning mapping the progress of transportation lines as well what about the private sector and your research infrastructure? Yeah, this is another uh, category of services that we are aiming to develop because having uh, 10 super sites uh, all over Europe, like from the north, from, from the north of Scotland, if you want, to the Mediterranean, to the Atlantic, uh, North Sea and, and Black Sea. So we can offer them a multitude of sites where they can test sensors, they can discover, you know, our possibilities. From a point of view, we have been working on this, on how to engage to let them know about what we can do and establish cooperation so that we can push on our ideas or they can use. So it's, it works two ways. Mm -hmm. So our idea is to, to better connect the scientific results to the markets and it's the other way around to show them that they can test some of their ideas using us as a test bed and, and as a facility that can, you know, give them more opportunities. For business, yeah. Mrs. Bopata, you also talked about the influence and the consequences for the public, for the general public, especially in some of the regions of Africa. From your perspective, what has changed thanks to the change in the data availability? You know, when you came up with the data, what has changed in the society? What are the impacts that need to be shared to the general public that the research infrastructure is actually providing to the general public? Uh, I think that that is a very important question because we need to ask questions around what are the socioeconomic benefits of mm -hmm. the you know, investments that, that we are making. And I'd, I'll, I'll give one first um, obvious example, which is extreme weather events. Um, I'll give you the example of the Idai tropical cyclone, mm -hmm. which, um, you know, the, the models really agreed, uh, you know, two days before the event actually made landfall. Um, so that in itself said that it uh, means that we had an opportunity to save the number of lives. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, I mean, it shows you that you actually need a value chain because you need an observation network, um, you need models. And then after that, after you have predicted the extreme weather, you need to disseminate this information so that they can, the public can, can um, respond mm -hmm. to these forecasts as they are coming out. So for that particular one, using satellite information, I would say it, the satellite inf information as well as the models really helped in that they were able to capture the event well in advance. Um, however, there was a loss of life of more than 1,000 people, and that is because people that were supposed to react to that information um, did not um, react as, as they should have. 
Um, so on the positive side, I'll give the example of the SMECRI, which is the shallow water, um, you know, shallow marine and, and coastal research infrastructure. In terms of the public, we've been able to engage with a lot of schools and um, we've got a, a very good example actually of one student who was a, a, a school learner of Sion who <laughs> is now doing a PhD in marine sciences. So this person has been, you know, was made aware of a career in marine sciences through the programs that, that, mm -hmm. that we are running. Then I'd, I would say that it's not that, you know, we, we have reached where we want to go to. So I just want to say, although um, the research infrastructures are there, they are assisting, we still have challenges in that the models that are available right now are not able to peak all, all the events. In April of, of, of this year, mm -hmm. uh, South Africa made headlines because we had this event that also resulted in the loss of life of more than 400 people. And for this particular event, the models were not able able to pick the amount of rainfall that was associated with it. The, the event came from a weather system that we know very well, which is a cut off low system. It's, it's a mid latitude system. And then when it got to the coastal area of South Africa, it behaved in a very different way. It behaved like a, a tropical system. Uh, and the models were not really able to capture that very, very well. Um, so that in itself says that although we are deploying all these research infrastructures, we need to do more. Mm -hmm. uh, the point that, that um, you made <coughs> about the observations not being available everywhere is, is a good point, and mm -hmm. that is available because you could see, like when you look at the network, you can see that there's a lot more over South Africa, but when you look north of South Africa, you also see there's still uh, this big gap mm -hmm. that's available. Mm -hmm. And mathematics cannot figure everything. You know. Yeah, yeah <laughs> of course, you, you need the ground truth <laughs> to check if your mathematics is correct. <laughs> what, what kind of experience can you share concerning the use of mathematics to, f to fill in the gaps? You know, when we are speaking about using the models to help the general public, to help the public awareness, I always recall what was happening in Australia at the beginning of 2020. Huge fires, huge fires everywhere. But I had an app on my phone that was sending me alerts, what happening in various parts of, uh, of Australia. It was important, it was relevant to me because I was covering it for, for Czech TV. But thanks to the models and thanks to the, thanks to the information that was shot immediately, I had perfect, from my perspective, perfect set of information to describe to the general public what was truly happening. I was just looking for the precise picture, the precise videos. How, yeah. do, how, do, how well, do you know, export it? A, a great saying as a mathematician, is, uh -huh. or applied mathematician, is that uh, all models are wrong. <laughs> so, all yeah, models are wrong. That's the motivation speech for that's the right. mathematicians. That's yeah. right. So, all models are wrong, the pandemic models are wrong, the fire models... Are vi fire is very, very hard to predict. Mm -hmm. when, when it is 42 degrees Celsius and the wind is going 120 kilometres an hour and the fire in those circumstances, actually creates its own weather. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. People in swimming pools can suffocate mm -hmm. because there's no oxygen for hundreds of metres in all directions. So there is no model in the world. We don't have a model. A we don't have a mathematical model for turbulence, which is how you got here on a plane, mm -hmm. if you got here on a plane. So models... Are, but, of course, models... We all model every day because we all predict the future. If you have no model, you have no prediction of the future, you don't get out of bed. Mm -hmm. Don't bother getting out of bed because gravity may have failed. So um, models are all wrong. That's a fatalistic, pr you know, uh, model, attitude. <laughs> models are all wrong, but they're better than having nothing. And mm -hmm. mathematical models are usually better than sort of putting your finger in the air and oh, I think there might be a fire today. So you know, this is the trouble explaining that to people. People get cranky when the predictions of weather or the stock market or a pandemic or a fire are not perfectly accurately, they think that science has failed. Well, sh who's the person, Nostradamus, was he the only person who predicted accurately anything? I don't know. So <laughs> this is... The, to, Thankfully to, not. The, we, we haven't explained to humanity that the models will never be perfect. They have to live and learn to deal with stochasticity, uncertainty and risk. And, and that's the interesting thing and from a communication, communication perspective is how do you explain risk and how to manage risk in decisions, mm. which happens a lot in water as well. All of the meteorologists are frustrated by the attitude of public. Why well, it's not sunny. It was supposed to be sunny. My colleagues say it every day. Uh, Mrs. Marinelli, there is a question that was sent uh, by uh, Beryl Morris during your talk. How much does understanding the polar region tipping points rely on observations and monitoring from non-polar regions? 
And if there is a dependency on non-polar region observations, how does the Office of Polar Programs coordinate with other global and continental scale environment research infrastructure observatories? Okay, so let, let me recap this question. It's, uh, it's about understanding when tipping points will occur and how the information is also I shared. Do, mm -hmm. I do believe that uh, it is uh, very real. Beryl Morris, who is asking, what is the relation? You know, you, sp you spoke about tipping points sure. concerning uh, the parts of the world, yeah. and he is asking about the influence of other parts of the world concerning the tipping points in these regions of the planet Earth. Uh, okay, so... Uh, I will just it adjust it the microphone. My apologies. Yeah. No Perfect. problem. Thank you. Okay, uh, it really depends on which uh, tipping point you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, if you were talking about global ocean circulation, you really have to understand circulation across all basins of the ocean because you would need to understand what uh, surface currents look like, what deep water currents look like, and how they're changing as a function of, of a number of factors. It's not just the atmosphere, it's the density of water that comes with, or the change in density that comes with melting of ice the extent to which uh, ocean water actually sinks. So when ocean water sinks because it's cold, it sinks all the way to the bottom and it creates a volumetric gap and then surface water fills in or moves in to fill it. And that's what creates global ocean circulation. So if you don't have that much drawdown because it's not as cold and if it's fresher and it stays more at, at, a, at, at a higher um, place in the water column, then you won't get the circulation driving the, um, uh, the water and the associated heat that goes with it. So to, if, let's think about a time frame. Ocean circulation occurs on the order of a thousand years. It takes that long for one parcel of water to go entirely through the ocean. And so looking at heat transport, changes in heat transport, and if we stopped emissions of carbon into the atmosphere and waited for the planet to kind of relax and absorb that change, the ocean is such a grand reservoir of heat that it would take a very, very long time. Let's go to a different, um, uh, a different problem, and that would be melting of ice caps. And melting of ice caps is something that even, again, if you stopped uh, emissions of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, there's still enough heat in the Earth to continue that melt. And the impact on humans at a lower latitude will be great simply because we have a lot of low-lying coastal areas. And so as sea level rise, coastal areas will become increasingly inundated. Fast forward to, in, in time, to the permafrost example that I talked about. Permafrost thaw is already a significant problem in the Arctic. There is already considerable instability in land and um, slumps that are occurring. Uh, communities that are having to relocate because they can no longer live in the areas where they have lived for time immemorial. And the time frame for permafrost change is really on the 50 to 200 year time frame. And so all of these are interconnected because they're connected to larger processes, but they're focused in that one particular area because of the, the characteristics of polar regions that they do have these big ice caps, that they do have a lot of stored carbon, and they are simply different. And so the focus is much, much greater. Have I answered the question? I, I do believe so. Concerning uh, the permafrost situation, we are also talking about a huge amount of methane that would be released to the atmosphere, causing yes. greenhouse effect, because it's more aggressive than uh, the carbon dioxide. It, and it, the, the extent to which it's methane really depends on whether the carbon decomposes in more of an anoxic environment or an oxic environment. Uh, mm -hmm. oxic environment. Uh, the good news about methane is it's a shorter, it, it has a, a shorter residence time in the atmosphere relative to carbon dioxide, but it is significantly more potent as a greenhouse gas. And the first example you used concerning the water switching places, let's say, in yeah. the oceans, that's the situation concerning Gulf Stream, isn't it? Yes, well, concerning Gulf Stream, it's, it's, it's partly that, um, but it's partly what happens to the water at the poles as it cools and then it sinks. And so there's uh, what we call meridional circulation, which is circulation of water that goes from you know, one part of the longitude of the planet all the way to the other. So it's kind of lengthwise across the Earth from pole to pole. And that's the kind of circulation that we're talking about. It's not just Gulf Stream, but it's part of what helps drive the Gulf Stream. Uh, final word of the lightning debate. 
Hugh Bossingham, the floor is yours. Oh, equity. Excuse me? Equity. Equity. True live word. One word. <laughs> Hugh Bossingham, the professor at the University of Queensland, Australia. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. as well as Natural Terrestrial Ecosystem Research Network Advisory Board Chair to add it in full. Mr. Stanika, your final word. Well, cooperation, working together. We can find solutions to the grand challenges if we work together. If we want to successfully work together, we need to have a common language, common understanding, and this is more than one word anyway. <laughs> Adrian Stanika, coordinator of uh, Danibius. Research infrastructure. Thank you very much. Please, final word. Okay, my final words are that um, environmental challenges do not respect political boundaries. So, as we invest in really expensive research infrastructures where we live, let's think about areas where these don't seem to be getting it, uh, deployed. Says Managing Director of the South African Environmental Observation Network, part of National Research Foundation, Mary Jane Bopapa. Thank you. Please. I think uh, I'll echo yours, which is the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. If we work collectively and we integrate, we will make progress faster. Director of the Office of Polar Programs of US National Science Foundation, Roberta Morinelli. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for being part of ICRI today. I do remind you that today is not ending up with this session. Naturally, uh, in the first floor, in less than an hour, the site events are starting. If you are joining us for different events that are not being organized here at the Passage Hotel, meaning uh, Ellie Eric, as well as uh, the event in Masaryk University, in Resetox, the grand opening of the Salespark Biobank. You can find all the information necessary for you to follow up in your email or in the official app. Tomorrow we are starting at 9 o'clock. There will be three parallel sessions followed by parallel teams. And natural the social event that is spread for tomorrow evening. So I do hope you will be ready to chat and to enjoy the evening here with all the participants of ICRI 2022. Thanks to Bea Broskova, you can check out before you leave and take a picture of the summary of what was happening today in the program. And I will be looking forward to meeting you all tomorrow. Thank you very much. Have a great day.